A listener note, this episode contains adult content and is not suitable for everyone. Please be advised. We recorded the original episode focused on the Gabby Petito case back in late September of this year, and since then, a number of significant developments have occurred. We left off before the autopsy results were done, and while Gabby's boyfriend, Brian Laundrie, had left his parents' Florida home, presumably into a wilderness preserve nearby. Despite a massive manhunt, he was not found. On October 12th, the Teton County coroner in Wyoming, where Gabby's body was found, determined that she was, and I quote, choked to death. This language is very specific. In an interview with Anderson Cooper, the coroner stated that not only was this an asphyxial death, but it was a strangulation via a throttling. Throttling is also a very specific term. When someone uses that term, they are talking about someone taking their two hands, putting them on their victim's throat, and applying pressure. And even though a person can be throttled from behind, in most cases, and my experience tells me it is probably what happened in this case as well, they are choked from the front, face to face. This means that whoever killed Gabby would need to be very close to her and would be looking into her eyes as she died. This is very intimate and implies that her killer most likely knew her. One common personality trait male abusers share is poor self-control. It's hard to determine a truly accurate portrait of pre-existing incidents of domestic violence in the relationships that end this way, because many prior choking incidents go unreported. But I think it's safe to say there were likely some explosive outbursts and rage-fueled moments in the relationship before the murder happened. And in Brian and Gabby's case, we know there were. Generally speaking, the perpetrator is usually very emotionally dependent on the victim. Their whole sense of self is wrapped up in that person. So the threat of breaking up can trigger this sort of tragic outcome. Why does that happen? Well, the desperation to keep the relationship together intensifies. He cannot deal with the notion that she could be happy without him. And so he takes control of the situation and kills her. The coroner's report also stated she had been out in the elements for three to four weeks before she was found in the Grand Teton National Park on September 19th. As a reminder, five days before Gabby's body was found, the police declared Brian Laundry a person of interest, and his parents reported him missing three days after that. Brian's family home was declared a crime scene later that week, and his parents surrendered all the guns in their home. It was at this time that they reported one of their guns was actually missing. We later learned that they said Brian had been grieving since he had gotten home and that they were worried he would hurt himself. In our original podcast on this case, I thought it was more likely a possibility that Brian was hiding or on the run than that he had killed himself. But remember, at that time, we did not know that a gun was missing from the house and that the parents told police Brian had been grieving. Grieving, plus a gun, plus the guilt and shame of murdering someone, obviously can make someone suicidal. On October 20th, Brian Laundrie's parents accompanied the investigators to the Carlton Nature Preserve, where Brian had last been seen. They searched an area that was previously underwater when initially searched weeks before and very quickly found a backpack and a notebook that belonged to Brian. Cadaver dogs were brought in 
and they uncovered human remains in that very area. The next day, the FBI confirmed that those remains matched the dental records of Brian Laundry, and the clothing was consistent with what Brian was last seen wearing. On November 23rd, an attorney for the Laundry family released a statement that Brian had died by suicide from a gunshot wound to the head. Both families are still trying to deal with the tragedies. The National Missing and Unidentified Person System, also known as NamUs, is a federally funded resource center to help law enforcement track cases. And although this site has been described as the nation's most effective database for tracking missing persons, many law enforcement agencies don't use it. In fact, only 10 states have passed legislation requiring law enforcement to enter missing person information into the federal database. Charges of accessory after the fact are still being considered against Brian's family. We have yet to know if they will be charged with anything. There is some hope that the notebook found with Brian's remains will provide some additional answers in this case. But at this point, we do not know what the notebook contains. To be honest, I'm not sure that any information found in Brian's journal will bring clarity to the families of these two young people and their senseless deaths. So once again, here is the original Killer Psyche episode on Gabby Petito and Brian Laundrie. On August 27th of this year, Jen Bethune and her family pulled into a campground in Wyoming's Grand Teton National Forest, hoping to find a spot to park. The family had been traveling and living in their converted 1983 tour bus. And as they drove down the long road towards the main campground, they spotted a white van on the left side of the road. But it was the license plates on the van that caught Jen's attention. They were from Florida. And since that is where she and her family were from, she thought it would be great to chat with other Floridians. However, the van appeared to be closed up and dark, so Jen figured that the occupants were either sleeping or maybe they were out. So they continued on their way. It was not until almost a month later when Jen was editing footage of her travels for her family's YouTube channel that she took a look at the footage from Wyoming. Around that same time, she was tagged on social media, alerting her to the news that police were asking for any information about a white van and a missing 22-year-old woman named Gabby Petito. Apparently, Gabby and her fiancé, Brian Laundrie, had been in the Tetons at the same time as the Bethunes. Remembering the Florida plates... Jen began pouring over her footage and she came across video of the white van she thought might be the one everyone was searching for. In an effort to help, she reached out to the FBI. They directed her to a tip line so she could tell investigators where she had come across that white van. This tip ended up being the clue that law enforcement needed to find Gabby Petito. From Wondery and Tree Fort Media, I'm Candace DeLong, and this is a special episode of Killer Psyche. I've spent five decades studying people's minds through my work as an FBI profiler and psychiatric nurse. Since my retirement, I am often asked by the media to give my opinion on why criminals do what they do. And for the last week, I've been doing just that about Gabby Petito and Brian Laundrie. My producer, Julie, and I talk about crime together, well, 
about pretty much every day. And this past week, it has been all about this case. I think it's fair to say that we both have been pretty consumed by the news coverage and social media posts. So we decided to postpone our regularly scheduled episode, and Julie and I are going to dive deep into the homicide case that has captivated America. By the way, I just want to say that in your in your introduction, you said that we talk maybe once a day about this. We talk like six times a day about true crime. You do realize that. We never yeah, stop talking about this. We have to stop meeting like this. My cats are getting suspicious. <laughs> All right. So, Candace, I think we want to start off this episode reminding everyone that all the information we have gathered is from the news reports that are on at this moment and from social media. Right. This is a conversation about a news story. This is not a court of law. Brian Laundrie is innocent until proven guilty, innocent in a court of law. And also, this is our opinions, right, Candace? Yes. Much of what I'll be saying is, is my opinion based on many years of working with victims and working with offenders. Things are happening really quickly in this case. We're recording this Sunday afternoon, September 26, but by the time it hits the air on Tuesday, a lot could have happened. So is this pace normal in terms of how an investigation of this type works? An investigation that has the media coverage, very high profile crime, yes, they do move very, very quickly. But an average investigation, no. Can you give us, before we go too far, can you give us a quick recap of the case? Sure. On July 2nd of this year, a young woman, Gabby Petito, only 22 years old, set out on what was supposed to be a four-month-long cross-country adventure with her fiancé, Brian Laundrie. Gabby wanted to be a travel influencer, a travel blogger, and so she was documenting the entire trip for a YouTube channel and her Instagram page. The couple planned to sleep in their van while they visited all kinds of national parks out west. And then something happened in Utah. Yeah, it was in Utah around August 12th that the police received on a 911 call, a man called and reported that he saw a young man slapping a young woman. He witnessed the man actually chasing the woman up and down the sidewalk and hitting her and then jumped in the car and sped off. Police eventually caught up with the van when they noticed that the van kind of went over a curb in addition to going 20 miles faster than the limit. So they were pulled over. We're going to listen to some of that footage in a bit, but I think that call went a little backwards for Gabby. She took all the blame and the police eventually let them go. On August 19th, the couple uploaded their first video entitled Van Life, the beginning of our van life journey. In the video, we see Brian and Gabby. They're being very affectionate with each other. And Gabby is talking about her adventures living and traveling in their white van. And we see all these gorgeous images of this beautiful environment that they're in. And it doesn't give any hint of any danger or any any problems that are occurring between the couple. No, it doesn't. They look like a very happy don't have a care in the world couple enjoying the great west. Sadly, uh, looks can be deceiving. Apparently on August 25th, that was the last time Gabby and her mother talked. Then a couple of days later, Gabby and Brian were seen at a restaurant in Wyoming where Brian was being very aggressive toward the staff, very difficult. Gabby was crying And they were asked to leave the restaurant. The restaurant is very interesting because we heard about that after we had already gotten a timeline. And then we got some news from some influencers that they had also been at the restaurant. They had seen this altercation happen. And it seemed like it was happening more between the restaurant staff and Brian than actually Gabby and Brian. Is that Right. If this account is accurate, people observing this 
said she was crying, Brian was being difficult, he was being aggressive, and that after they left, Brian went back into the restaurant three times and was complaining to the staff or yelling at the staff. Yeah, I I know that the manager talked to the FBI, but she said that they had no comment on it. If what we're hearing is true, well, it's very concerning that somebody would be acting so aggressively and being so difficult in a busy restaurant that they would be asked to leave and that that person goes back in and and berates or hassles the staff. Um, Yikes. Yeah, and what's even more distressing is this is the second time we've heard that Gabby has been crying. Her friend that they interviewed on CBS said that she wasn't someone that would cry very often, that she was very laid back. So it seems like she was distressed from when we saw her on the police body cam footage all the way through to this restaurant. And that's that's right. And it's two weeks later. So but for the pictures showing this idyllic, wonderful life they're living, we have bookends on, I believe, August 14th. the the police stopped him. And then this event where things are not good at all. And Gabby appears to other people to be the passive one. She's not the fighter. She's not the antagonist. And then Gabby's mom gets this really cryptic text. Right. The text said words to the effect of, I'm getting stands, emails and texts. Could you please take care of it? Something like that. Stan is Gabby's grandfather, but she never called him Stan. So that was a real head scratcher for her mother. Like, why why is she doing it this? It reminds me a little bit about the stories that you hear about domestic abuse victims calling for pizza and they're calling the yes. cops and they place their order. But that's their way of telling someone that they need help. Or it could have been that she was already dead and and he was using it to text the mom to make it seem as though she was alive. We don't know that. Well, if the date is accurate, then I'd say it is a very safe deduction that Gabby was already dead. Yeah, that's... Well, on September 1st, Brian returned to Florida in Gabby's van without her. I mean, that's immediately suspicious to me. Well, when I heard it, my heart sank. Well, what's even more troubling is he wouldn't speak to Gabby's parents. And he then referred them to an attorney. To me, that that just screams there's a problem. So, yeah, super big red flag here that something is terribly amiss. The parents couldn't get any kind of answer from Brian. So they sent over people to do a welfare check. And when they couldn't find Gabby that way, they filed a missing persons report on her September 11th. There's another very telling thing about this whole Brian wouldn't talk to her parents Thing, and it was his parents would not talk to her parents. Gabby's parents, from their point of view, wait a minute, our daughter is living in your home with your son, has been for months, and you won't help us? You won't talk to us? At what's going on here? And then there was a report that his parents, he and his parents took a trip over the weekend, but we haven't had that confirmed. Suddenly on Tuesday, his parents said that he went out for a hike, took his backpack, and he never returned. And they reported him missing that Friday. They don't report him missing for three days? Yeah. Seems concerning, right? Especially because the day that he went missing, apparently, he released a statement that he's going to stay silent. And that very next day, that's when the police named him a person of interest. And then he disappears. Mm -hmm. So as an investigator, what do you think when you hear his parents waited three days to sound the alarm on their own son's disappearance? They were buying him time, that he was on the run. They knew it. And it was all determined by the three of them before he left. One of the things that the parents said at the time, well, he's missing, we're very concerned because he didn't take his phone or his wallet, but he did take his backpack, didn't he? Yes, he did. 
So you can put a whole lot of stuff in a backpack. And maybe he was trying to create the illusion to take his own life. Yeah. And initially, I have to tell you, before we got a lot more facts, I thought, oh, he killed her and he's going to kill himself now. But a few days later, I was pretty much convinced that was not the case. I thought the same thing. And then, as you said, as we get more and more information, it starts to feel the opposite. Like he's actually doing this because he feels he can escape. On September 19th, Gabby's remains were found in the Grand Teton National Park in Wyoming. And a few days later, the initial report from the coroner has said that the cause of death is homicide. Does that mean mm -hmm. they can change their mind? Does it normally happen? It could, but they don't usually. There's two things that are very important in a medical examiner or coroner's report. One is, what is the cause of death? There are only four causes of death, suicide, homicide, accident, or natural causes, such as dying of a heart attack in your sleep when you're 95 years old. There is another thing called undetermined, and that simply is the box that the coroner checks if they are unable to determine that the death was caused by any of those other four things. But in this case, he's saying the cause of this woman's death, and it is Gabby, is homicide. Now, what else are we waiting for? Well, we're waiting for the manner of death. What caused the homicide? Was it multiple stab wounds, blunt force trauma, gunshot wound, strangulation, that kind of thing? As someone asked me, well, how can they determine if it's a homicide, but they can't say anything else? There are clues at a crime scene where a body is found that can paint the picture or certainly lead an experienced investigator say, okay, this is a homicide. For example, if the body is found in a shallow grave or a deep grave, they were murdered. If the body is found and the hands are tied, maybe there's a gag or, or duct tape around the mouth, they were murdered. Things like that. However, part of any autopsy is the toxicology report. And that usually takes a while to come back. I'm intrigued by the fact that the coroner's report's four or five days old now, and there has been no information about the manner of death. Uh, the body was out in the elements for almost 20 days. So there could have been advanced decomposition, and they may have to do extensive testing to find out exactly how did this happen. Frequently, in cases of husband, wife, girlfriend, boyfriend, uh, lover, spat, uh, fight escalates to murder, the manner of death is strangulation. Very, very common. However, strangulation is by damage caused to soft tissue around the throat and the trachea. And then with decomposition of the skin tissue, it may be very difficult to determine weeks later. Well, could the coroner be holding back information because... Yes, absolutely. I think the first people that will know after the coroner will be her parents. And they may already know. But there can be a lot of reasons why they're not releasing it. And it also is possible they don't have that manner of death yet. So there was a warrant issued for Brian, but it wasn't mm -hmm. for murder. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Apparently... When Brian was still in Wyoming, he used Gabby's debit card and he used it to get $1,000 cash. But this was after she went radio silent. He wasn't with her. So therefore, she could not possibly have given him authority. And that's why they were able to issue this warrant. Now, this warrant also gives the FBI the ability to arrest anyone, parents or otherwise, that knows Brian is on the run and assist him in doing so. That would be aiding and abetting. Well, they seized a lot of stuff from his parents' house. What is it do you think that they were looking for? Well, one of the things they probably seized was all digital devices, laptops, iPads, cell phones, anything of Brian's as well as his parents'. 
I'd be looking for cash withdrawals from ATMs, Brian's and, and theirs at cash advances on credit cards, withdrawals from savings accounts, cashing in CDs or bonds or anything like that. You can't be on the run forever without any money. And you can't be on the run very long when there are hundreds of trained personnel looking for you with dogs and drones and helicopters and airplanes and all of this publicity. I think we need to point out that Brian, when he disappeared, he disappeared supposedly into this 25,000-acre wildlife preserve. I know people say, well, he's a survivalist. He can live out there for a long time. Well, not in these conditions. His parents did give him a head start, though. Mm -hmm. They have yet to find him. And that's kind of where we're at right now on Sunday, September 26th. There are so many moving parts and so many conflicting reports that it's, it's really overwhelming. How do we know what to believe? Well, oftentimes in very high profile murder cases or kidnapping cases, people come out of the woodwork with stories. I've seen it over and over. People like to get involved. They like to help the police. They report things they think they know. They report things they think they heard that really have nothing to do with it. So, for example, someone thought they spotted Brian somewhere backpacking and took a picture of him, and it was it turned out not to be him, but it was 500 miles away. I'm not saying that was the wrong thing to do. The guy in the picture did very much resemble Brian, but that's the kind of thing that happens in cases like this. People want to help. But it also can take up police time. I'm sure you've come across that when you were investigating. Oh, yes, absolutely. A lot of cops will say, I hate the public. I hate their intervention. I like it. Yes, there's problems, but a lot of cases have been solved by people paying attention. Well, certainly in this case, I think they found Gabby's body so quickly because the Bethunes were able to say exactly where they saw the van. They may not ever have found her body, but for the tip from the Bethunes, she was able to tell the FBI to provide the video for them and tell them, look, this was outside of Grand Teton National Park. And the FBI started looking there. And within 48 hours, they found her body. Why is it that the FBI is handling this case? Why is it an FBI case? The reason that the FBI is involved with local police in Florida and Wyoming is it appears that the case, the murder happened in a national park. Uh, And the FBI has jurisdiction for investigations of crimes that happen in national parks. But even if it were not in a national park where her body was found, it's uh, two different states, probably 1,000, 1,500 miles apart. And local jurisdictions just don't have the resources to do investigations all over the country, but the FBI does. This has certainly gotten a lot of attention. And we know the FBI is involved because of the national park now, but My question is, I read an article that says there's been almost 710 indigenous people that have disappeared in Wyoming, most of them in the same area where Gabby disappeared. Why don't we hear about the FBI investigating them? Why is it this case that's getting so much attention? Yes, and it's being called missing white woman syndrome. It's shameful. It is shocking. And I'll bet Very few people can name any of them. In fact, it's not just indigenous people. It's also non-white people, African-Americans, Latinos, and they just aren't getting the coverage. I I saw a report about a young man, a geologist from South Carolina, is uh, named Daniel Robinson. He's African-American. He disappeared in Arizona on June 23rd. His father was so frustrated by the lack of assistance he was getting from the police, he hired a private investigator because he felt he needed more attention on his son's case. That shouldn't happen at all. Yeah, according to FBI data in 2020, Black people make up 35% of missing person reports, but only 13% of the U.S. population. White people make up 54% of missing persons and 76% of the U.S. population. And we're not including in there 
other people of color or indigenous people. So that is highly disproportionate. It is. It 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 very much is. I think the term missing white woman syndrome is very accurate. And if that missing white woman happens to be pretty and young, it gets people's attention. There's many things about Gabby and Brian's story that is interesting. They were a young couple in love, off on an adventure, and one of them disappears and then her body is found. That's interesting no matter who the participants are. Nevertheless, the media saturation is profound and it is disproportionate to non-white people. I'm not criticizing the amount of attention that Gabby's case has received. I just believe that there's a lot of missing person cases out there and they all deserve the same amount of attention. Intense investigation. It's a huge problem, much bigger than we can even talk about in this podcast. But I think social media, just in general, is starting to help get the word out for all these different cases, hopefully. It's a younger generation that knows a lot more about these things. And they they also find true crime fascinating. And I, why do we find true crime so fascinating? I mean, is it something sick inside of us or <laughs> what's the deal? Well, I don't know about you. I get asked this question a lot. I don't think I'm sick. I don't think you're sick. I think part of the reason is the vast majority of us never in our lifetime would we be a victim, would we know of a victim of violent crime, murder, or even meet an FBI agent. So it's it's fascinating. It's kind of a curious thing. And I think we're always, as we say in the trailer to the show, why? Why would someone do such a horrible thing? I cannot fathom stabbing another person. How did this happen? Why did she kill her husband? You know, all this kind of stuff. And yeah, it's interesting. For every single one of these stories, Julie, from my point of view, it's a cautionary tale. Yeah, I think it's a great lesson. There's lots of drama in a relationship. But when is it too much drama? Well, we're all on our best behavior in the beginning of a relationship. Usually into year two, people start to let their guard down a little bit. And that's when people, oftentimes they're they're in love, they think they're in love, they're committed to the relationship, and they ignore red flags. I recently read a story about the number of women between 15 and 20 that in a survey said they had been subjected to verbal or physical abuse by their boyfriend. And I was really surprised. It was, I think, one in four. But the type of abuse could start out with name calling, such as you're a bitch. It could be um, light, if you want to call it light, manhandling. Like, for example, maybe the man puts his hands on, on the woman's arms and shakes her. Listen to me. Listen to me. I'm talking to you. Those are the early stages, those are red flags, that it's going to get worse. I think we'd all agree. If you were on a first or second or third date and somebody grabbed you and shook you and said, listen to me or poke their finger at you, you probably have no trouble not seeing them again. But once you're into the relationship a year or two, people are like, well, that didn't really happen. Or, well, he was drinking. He didn't mean that. If you find yourself making excuses for someone else's bad behavior, you could be in for trouble. Well, according to friends, Gabby and Brian, when they were dating back in Long Island, they go back and forth from fighting to being in love to fighting and being in love. And then they moved down to to Florida and they moved in together during COVID with his family. We have reports that they were engaged and then they broke up. They broke off their engagement. The mother says it's because they were too young, but they decide to still go on this trip together. So can we assume that they were still in a good place? Well, if I had to speculate, and we all know I'm going to, I think they were probably in the let's get back to the way we were. We'll just forget about all this bad stuff that's gone on between us. And when we're out on the road having a wonderful time going to all these beautiful places, everything will be fine. I guess there is some kind of cabin fever aspect, isn't there? Traveling across the country in that small a van 
where you're already out of your element, where there's nothing around you that is familiar. I think that that probably played into a lot of the tension that occurs. I mean, is, isn't that a, that's a thing, right? Cabin fever. I couldn't agree with you more. Yes, it's a thing. One of the things we do know is that incidences of domestic abuse go up in times where people cannot get away from each other in particular. Well, let's look at this recent pandemic. In the winter of 2020, domestic homicides went up, domestic abuse went up. Why? For people are living together and someone's an abuser and another person is a victim, but the victim can't leave or is afraid to leave. At least there's eight hours in a day when they're not with the abuser. And that all ended because of COVID for a lot of people. And murders went up since 2017. Approximately four women a day are murdered in America in domestic abuse cases. I just want to say that we do not know for certain that Brian was abusing her consistently. We're just responding right. to witness reports that. He was hitting her in public. Doesn't this signify that he lacks any type of impulse control? He didn't even try to hide it. What does that tell you? If a man would hit a woman in public in the middle of the day where he could be seen, what do you think he'd do in private, Julie? He came across in the videos as being so sweet and docile and in love, but maybe he wasn't this sweet, docile guy. I mean, obviously him hitting her proves that not to be right. true, but how is it that we're seeing this one side of him and yet there's all these other people just catching little bits and glimpses of his violence? Well, you hit the nail on the head. Poor impulse control. He would get angry and might think, I'd really like to hit you right now, but most people that would feel that would not hit someone and, and let me say this about abusers. They tend to be charming. They let people see what they want people to see in public. For example, oh, when yeah. they were pulled over by the police, he turned it around completely. The police initially pulled them over because of something they thought he did. And he was so charming that he was able to turn it around on Gabby. Yes, you're right. He was Dr. Charm. But there's something else he did. The police at first separated them and Brian walks up to them and within a few seconds says, she gets like this, she escalates, and I just have to get away from her and let her calm down. Oh, that's interesting. So the first thing he says to the cops is painting a picture that Gabby has a problem. And this has happened before. And then... With Gabby not anywhere around them, she's in the patrol car. He's telling the cops she's just crazy. His exact word, kind of like shrug shoulders, wink, wink, guy to guy. So with those two things that he said to the cops, he painted a picture for them that he's the victim. They seem to have forgotten the report was that he was hitting her. He very proudly rolls up his sleeve and shows them scratches on his arm. Well, maybe those scratches were her fighting him off. He does get really buddy-buddy with them, especially when he's like, it's the little things. And the cop is saying, oh, yeah, yes. it's the little thing. I've been married for a while. And he, he makes it relatable. He's smiling. He's talking with everybody. He's very polite. In fact, I think we have um, some footage. Let's listen to that now. I didn't get overtly physical. I was just trying to keep her away and, and not get hit. And then I got really loud and like that's probably your everyone's attention where I was going, you know, back up, get away, just give me a uh, Okay, so, so you I, said you pushed her to create some distance, obviously, yeah. right? What happened after that? What got what got the scratches on your eye? The phone. The phone. Mm -hmm. So you pushed her and she hit you? She was I wasn't I, I it wasn't like a push and she jumped on me. She was she was already she was already I don't want to He's already swinging, and I was present. A lot of angles, a lot of nails, a lot of rings. Yeah. You got yeah. three scratches in your neck. You got one on the left side of your nose. You got one in your face here, and you got four blood bleeding over there. So it's like two hands coming out. Do you mind lifting up your right sleeve for me? I'm curious about something. Oh, oh. Okay. Yeah. It's a little bit I suppose fingernails, but yeah. I'm not complaining. Absolutely. I'm not complaining about fingernails. Is it bruised or tender or anything like no, that? No, no, no. Okay. 
I'm fine, and I love Gabby. I, I hope she doesn't have too many complaints about me. <laughs> I'm just, uh, you know, I, I feel bad I didn't get so public. I was just trying to be loud and to listen. This is, you know, I try to make her calm down and be like, look, everyone's watching. Like, so we see here he has completely turned the police from investigating him to believing that she was the instigator of the abuse. It is a common MO. I've seen it before. I am even aware, Julie, of cases where an abuser, after abusing his domestic partner, called the police, and before the police get there, the person injures themselves. And when the police get there, they have to take someone away. Who do you think they're going to take away? They're going to take away the person that's not bleeding. So what are some of the primary characteristics of the abuser? The most common one is the abuser is trying to control everything about their relationship, everything about the victim. They dominate them at domination and control. They make the victim feel responsible for their own abuse. Don't make me hurt you. That's their mantra. A lot of these abusers, they come across as cool, calm, and collected, as Brian did with the cops, but really they're very insecure, and that's why they feel the need to control their partner all the time. Gabby's friends said that Brian was very jealous. They had plans to go out to a club one night, and when they got there, she realized that she didn't have her ID, that Brian had taken it. For the controller, it's not so much that they love the person as much as they want to possess them. On one occasion, they went into this little knick-knack travel store, and the woman behind the counter, the owner of the store, noticed that Gabby had a tattoo on her arm that was uh, a bird, and started talking about that. And the store owner said that Brian was becoming very nervous and pushy, and he was trying to get Gabby to tell the store owner that she was engaged to him. But why would he need her to know that? Was it because he was attracted to the other woman, or why do you— No, no. I think it speaks to his intense insecurity. She's my fiancé. This fabulous woman you're talking to is going to marry me. Doesn't that say something about me, that this wonderful, beautiful— sweetheart of a person is going to marry me. It was incredible. Oh, so it's not just like guilt by association. It's like importance by association. Exactly. Yeah. Well put. I know that you always say that jealousy is one of the primary causes of murder. How does that evolve into killing someone? I mean, I get jealous of people that have a high metabolism, you know, how I'm not going to go and kill them. <laughs> how, do, how, how does that transition into being jealous enough to kill someone? One of the things we know about men that kill women they love, and men kill women they love at four times the rate women kill a man they love. It is a myth that women are out there killing lovers and husbands as much as men are. It's not true. A few years after the O.J. Simpson murder trial where he was acquitted, but he was found liable in the wrongful death suit, a book came out called, by him, If I Did It. And what became the big story is just one line in that entire book, which was, if I did it, it would have been because I love her so much. And this is the jealous murderers mantra. These are people that don't have a strong sense of self. And they believe if their partner left them, they would die. They would have nothing. So when that partner does leave, he has to kill her. For him, it makes perfect sense. And there's a lot of research on this very subject. So they'd rather have the person dead than yes. not to have them. Because if they're dead, then if nobody I, has yes. them. Yes, that's right. That is absolutely right. It's hard to understand, but it's a very base human emotion. I guess the fact that Gabby fighting back or hitting him or anything would have maybe made him 
angrier. Is that correct? Is there a relationship between jealousy and anger and domination? Frequently, not always. Sometimes people feel jealousy, but they don't feel anger and, and they don't feel the need to control. But in the case of someone as insecure as as Brian seems to have been about Gabby, yeah, anger frequently is going to happen because it's a panic situation. I'm guessing if the shop owner was right about that, about what she saw, her assessment of what she saw, Brian and Gabby had another fight when they got to the car. Probably, why didn't you tell her about me? Why, you know, aren't you proud of me? Don't you love me? And you know what, Julie? Nothing is less attractive than insecurity. I hear you. I want to go back because we were talking about how Gabby might not have wanted him to think that she was getting him in trouble because she was taking the blame. Let's go back to that time in Utah when they were pulled oh, yes, over. Yes. And she kept saying he was mad because of something that she did and that that it was because she had issues. I, I think we have the audio from that. Let's just take a quick listen to that. You want to tell me what's going on? Yeah, I don't know. It's just some days I, <laughs> I have really bad OCD, and okay. I just I was just cleaning and straightening up the back of the van before, and I was apologizing to him and saying, "I'm sorry that I'm so mean because sometimes I have OCD and sometimes I just get really frustrated. I'm not like mean towards him. I just like I guess my vibe is like I." Is that the classic MO for an abuse victim? Frequently, especially if they feel trapped and the police are there. Uh, They will frequently say, he didn't mean it. I made him angry. I shouldn't have done that. The thing about it that also struck me is Brian is absolutely fine letting her take the rap. No, he's encouraging it. He's pushing them towards thinking that, well, she just gets out of control. She likes things clean. And she keeps saying, I have OCD. That's my problem because I wanted things to be clean. And her father said that she didn't have OCD. So why would she say that? OCD is a personality disorder. We've talked about those a lot on the show, but this is one that does generally not have any kind of criminal implications at all. And she'd never been diagnosed with OCD. But in in our vernacular, it's become a term for just being compulsively neat. But while she's telling the trooper, you know, I was OCDing, I was cleaning up and straightening up the the cabin, you know, the, the van inside the van, she's crying while she's saying it like, she did something wrong. Yeah, she's hysterical. Uh, it's 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 so yeah. sad. She is all over the place. She cannot concentrate. She cannot say what's wrong. I think she's afraid to say, because the cop said, did he hurt you? She absolutely would not say, yeah, as a matter of fact, get me out of here. And by the way, that's my van. She didn't have the strength to do that. Abuse victims, they are frequently afraid to tell the police what's going on for fear of what will happen to them. What I think we both were talking about is that even though there's pictures of her and pictures of him and pictures of them together, there's never a picture with anybody else in that. Right. Yet they were periodically in campgrounds where there were other people. Considering how gregarious Gabby was, I find that a little strange, but now that we're learning more about Brian, who was jealous and certainly wouldn't want her around other people, maybe that's the reason. And then when they're in other settings, like restaurants, we know they ran into trouble. It looks to me like 
Brian was unraveling. Well, it certainly does appear that way. If somebody can't keep their temper and their emotions, especially being surrounded by people in a restaurant or on a sidewalk, it feels as though he's slightly losing control, but he doesn't appear that way in the police audio cam. How is it that he's able to flip so easily? Well, he's practiced, like I say, Dr. Charm to the rescue. And he puts on that mask. But she was a young, scared, inexperienced girl. And she was the emotional one. And Brian was just, was able to, I think, convince them. He planted the seed. She's crazy. He actually said it. Yeah. And that was two weeks before the the end came. Yes. I can't even imagine what Gabby was thinking in her final days. Well, the last conversation her mother had with her, Gabby did not indicate to her mother that there was a big problem and she needed help. But that's not unusual for abuse victims. He might have been standing over her every time she was talking to her mother. What do you think Brian's mindset is like now, now that he has taken off and he's Mm. disappeared? If Brian has not taken his own life, and I do not believe he has, abusers rarely kill themselves. I, I wouldn't be surprised that he's going over and over and over again in his mind what happened, that Gabby ended up making him kill her. That's probably what he's thinking. And we know this because men that commit spousal murder or partner murder, that's what they tell us. In many ways, believe what they did was the only way to resolve what was going on. I didn't want to kill her. She made me do it. So do you think it's something where he snapped? Well, we know that interpersonal violence, one person to another, partner to partner, escalates. It doesn't de-escalate. People don't, in, in the midst of raising their arm to slap or slug their partner They don't suddenly go, oh, you know what? I did this last time. I don't want to do this again. No, they follow through and hit them even harder. There are witnessed accounts, more than one, of Brian being aggressive with her in public. And what we know is she ended up a murder victim. And he's on the run. Was it premeditated? No, not likely but that they finally had an argument and he just ended the argument the way he wanted it ended. If he's, if he's apprehended alive and he decides to talk, he would say, I didn't mean to kill her. Well, no, wait a minute. You're bigger, stronger. What did you think was going to happen? Abusers rarely have an explanation for that other than, well, I, I did it because I loved her. Yeah. I, 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 loved, I loved her too much, I guess. There's a lot of resources that are being used up as he's running. We've seen there's been drones, dogs, people that don't even, are not law enforcement are searching for him in this area. How long will they continue to search for him in this kind of way, do you think, before they call it? Until pretty much... Here comes a cliche. Every stone is unturned. No more leads are coming in. This is a homicide investigation, and he is a person of interest. The search in certain areas may eventually stop, but the investigation will not be closed. Where do they go from here? There is so much happening right now in this investigation that the public does not know, and nor should they. My guess is a whole lot of people that know Brian are being interviewed. It's a high interest, high profile case. And in those situations, these things are usually resolved one way or the other fairly quickly. Right. Things are very fluid. They are changing daily. By the time you hear this, it might have changed substantially. But the one thing that won't change is that Gabby Petito unfortunately lost her life. I know that there is probably no closure that can happen for them, but what is it that Gabby's family can get from the capture of Brian and knowing what happened? Right, right. It's an interesting thing about closure. And 
I've heard it a million times in the last 40 or 50 years that I've been paying attention to this kind of thing. Well, at least they have closure. No, I, I, I agree with you. There's, there's only one kind of closure, and the closure is, okay, we now know what happened. But for the parents or loved ones, this is something people don't get over. Closure is like what the rest of us like to think happens. Even when killers or someone is apprehended, put on trial and convicted, that's not closure either because they don't have the person they love back again. But what they do have is, okay, okay, we know what happened and the bad guy is going to prison. That's the best they can hope for. So rather than closure, we hope that justice is served. Absolutely. Hope that justice is served and that her family can find some sense of peace down the road. I certainly hope and pray that in the coming days. Excuse me. I'm sorry. It's okay. This is so sad. It's always sad for me when a young person loses their life. I've, you know, I've, I've been with a lot of people when they died, not usually in this kind of situation, but being a nurse. And this is just a sad, sad story to think that two young people who may have had promising lives and one of them ends up dead and the other one on the run. And it didn't have to be this way. I hope and pray for Gabby's family and all her friends and loved ones that very soon will have resolution to this, and that in the end, justice prevails. Next week on Killer Psyche, the East Hampton murder. From Wondery and Tree Fort Media, this is Killer Psyche. I'm your host, Candace DeLong. This episode was written and produced by Lisa Ammerman and Julie Burke, edited by Joshua Morales and Maxwell Carney, with research and editing assistance from Ann Liu. Our senior audio producer is Tom Monahan. Renee Levesque is production manager. And Haley Mandelberg is production coordinator. Brandon Clark and Lindsay Whistler are production assistants. And the line producer is Oscar Guido. Our executive producers are Kelly Garner and Lisa Ammerman for Treefort and Marsha Louie and Aaron O'Flaherty for Wondery. The series is produced by Wondery and Treefort Media.